welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world today. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I am pleased to welcome Karen Hoffman. Karen has over 10 years experience in sustainable tourism and now works to promote conservation through environmental education. She holds a PhD in researching ways to increase individual conservation behaviours to help protect vulnerable areas, in particular the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. (laughs) So talking specifically about the Great Barrier Reef, since that's your area of expertise, What kind of things are causing damage to it? There's multiple things. The overarching certainly is climate change. And what contributes to that, of course, are multiple different areas. We can't say it's just agriculture or it's just mining. Um, Certainly they contribute as well as crown of thorn starfish uh, damaging parts of the reef and the effects of climate change and warming seas. So and coral bleaching is, of course, a big issue. So what's the starfish, did you say? It's the crown of thorns starfish or cops as they're also called. They're a a naturally occurring animal on the Great Barrier Reef, but they actually develop. So the little uh, baby uh, embryos, I suppose, they develop on the coastline. So usually in mangrove areas, very close to the coastline. So what happens is they are naturally occurring and they only have very few predators. So when they're naturally occurring and just in their normal numbers, it's not a problem. But because of high nutrient levels in the water and the water quality close to the coast, the actual uh, starfish are growing faster and they're also producing more rapidly. So we're getting an influx and some places they get um, big outbreaks of crown of thorn starfish and they can then eat particular types of coral and it looks very similar to coral bleaching because it eats all of the colour right. algae out of the coral. Does that cause any difficulties in determining like the extent of damage or measuring it? I don't think it makes it difficult to determine what the cause is. The people who are usually monitoring it are very well versed in what's causing the bleaching and what's causing the damage. So when coral is bleached, there are multiple reasons for it. It's uh, basically when the coral is stressed and it can become stressed due to a change in temperature of water. But it can also be from disease or from crown of thorn starfish and just a general change in water quality, so more nutrients or maybe some fuel or oil or something like that that's changing the water quality. So it sounds like it's a very delicate ecosystem that we're obviously disrupting quite a bit with our activities. So I've also seen a lot of like conservation efforts that they focus on restricting access to areas. Is that an effective way of saving the environment or is there a way for people to interact with natural environments that isn't harmful? Yeah, that's a great question, Rebecca. And I think uh, one of the things that's happened on the Great Barrier Reef in 1981, I believe it was, zoning was introduced. So there's everything from um, green zone, which is a no-take zone, um, there are pink zones, which are, I believe, a research zone. Uh, you've got zones where some fishing is allowed. You've got other zones where commercial fishing is allowed. So there are some areas also where no access is permitted whatsoever. And it's twofold. So we may think that it's better. In one respect, it is better. So an example is Lady Elliot Island. So before the zoning came into place, fishing was allowed all around the island. And it was really badly affected. A lot of the larger fish that have really a, play a really important part in the ecosystem. So they um, were disappearing. But what was then noticed once the uh, the zoning was put in place, the bigger fish started to come back. And it's just incredible that they actually somehow know that they are safe in those areas. And now it's an ecotourism resort. It's very popular. It's very um, well protected. And also the quality of the coral there is very good as well as uh, the marine life there. So what's good about restricting it is that you can then limit potential damage or potential uh, impacts on that area twofold where it's not good one is that who's monitoring it the great barrier reef is the size of italy or japan or germany even if that's 
any of those countries if you have an idea. It's massive. And the, the amount of staff that the Great Prairie Reef and Marine Park Authority have is quite limited. So they can't patrol everywhere. They can't monitor everything. So we don't always know what's going on in all of the different parts of the Great Barrier Reef. So where it's good to actually have access, especially tourism. So sometimes people think that the tour boats uh, make a big impact, a big negative impact on the areas and on particular reefs. The impact that they have is actually quite limited. Where they have a positive impact is they are stewards for the reef. So they go to the same places generally, sort of a selection of places, so they can see how the health of that area is looking on a day-to-day -day basis. They can report that information back either just through general sightings or through citizen science apps or programs. And that's really valuable for the authorities to be able to actually see what the health is. So that's where it's important to actually allow people to have access to particular areas. Okay, so that makes sense. Like you can still visit and, you know, get to see the natural beauty, but without being able to do the activities that are damaging. Exactly. So yeah. apart from being a beautiful landmark, what other kind of benefits does the Great Barrier Reef and other co coral systems in general provide us? Yeah, so the Great Barrier Reef um, or any reef system, over 25% of marine life actually spend a part of their life on a coral reef. So whether that's the Great Barrier Reef or any other coral reef system, as you said. So often they start in mangroves, so it's like a nursery. And then as they get a little bit bigger and they get a bit more bold, they can then extend their range of uh, for feeding and breeding, certainly on coral reefs. So everything from the tiniest critters up to humpback whales will spend time on the Great Barrier Reef or in reef areas. So it's really important in terms of the critters, in terms of the marine life. But the Great Barrier Reef is actually the biggest ecosystem in the whole world. So it's obviously protected by World Heritage. And it's really important on that level. It's important also on a recreational level because of the beauty, as you said. It is very important for people to see that because we know that when people see something, when they connect with it emotionally, they're more likely to protect it. So that's what's important. So if we can at least get people to see this firsthand, and if not, other research I've done look using the use of documentaries and virtual reality to get people to still connect with it without actually having to go there is really important. It's that emotional connection that allows people to want to protect it. So that's important. Some of the um, marine life is also used on a medicinal basis. So the cone shell, for example, it's deadly to humans. The poison that's in it is 100 times more powerful than cyanide. So it can do some severe damage to people if not kill them. And, and it's what they use to hunt for food, basically. But it's also used as a painkiller. So it, it has real value in that respect. And of course, then you've got cultural value. Yeah, so Indigenous people have, have been living within the Great Barrier Reef. And again, all reef systems, no doubt, where there's Indigenous people, which there are all around the world, um, to survive. And, you know, they're the ones who have figured out sustainability a long time ago. So they knew to only take what they needed, not yeah. to take excess. Do you think that lifestyle where you're really well integrated um, with the environment and interacting with it naturally is something that we in, in more Western society should be emulating? I think a, a, a big issue is how deep do we go? It's essentially, <laughs> you know, marketing telling us that we need more and we need more and we need more and better and better and better. So really, if we can limit to what we really need, not just what we want, then I think we could all live much more sustainably. And when you're living in a city, for example, and you go to the shop, you turn on any kind of media, you're going to be bombarded with marketing telling you that you need more. And I think that if we could really just take what we need and have a better understanding of where everything comes from. So there's still a lot of people who don't understand where their chicken and their eggs come from that yeah. they buy in the supermarket so having that connection with nature and perhaps even going and living off the land you know maybe it should be a part of a service at high school that we go and live off the land for a certain period of time to really understand where everything comes from and also appreciate how the amount of work part, that goes into it as well like that's right yeah yeah and what part that living creature plays in the yeah. bigger ecosystem 
So it, even when we kill a fly or a mosquito or something, you know, we do it haphazardly because it's created some discomfort within us. So we want to mm-hmm. make ourselves comfortable. So we remove that discomfort in whatever way. But every living being plays a part in the ecosystem. And if we have an understanding of what part it plays, we're probably more likely to want to protect it and live within the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something that I think people should be trying to embrace more is just understanding how it's all connected. And I feel like some of the natural disasters that we're going through, like, you know, COVID-19 pandemic and then just recently the floods, the supply chain issues that are cropping up as a result of it, I think is making people become more aware of you know the fact that it's not just magically appearing in the shops (laughs) you know like there's a whole process that things have to go through to get to them and learning to appreciate that is I think an important thing now going back to the reef and getting a bit more on on topic I have heard a lot about coral bleaching but Mm -hmm. is bleached coral actually dead or is it can it recover from that? I'm happy to explain how coral bleaching works. If that's yes, thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so often people think coral is a plant or a rock, basically, but it's not. It's actually a living animal, and it lives symbiotically with an algae called zooxanthellae. And zooxanthellae um, provides the colour for the coral, and it also allows for photosynthesis. And then the coral provides food and protection for this tiny, tiny little algae. So there's different kinds of zooxanthellae, which is why you have different colours in coral as well. So the more zooxanthellae you have in coral, usually the darker the colour. So we're, again, marketing has led us to believe that coral should be fluorescent colours, that it should be nice and bright. But in fact, the deeper, the darker the colour, So the dark oranges, greens, browns are really healthy coral with lots of good, healthy zooxanthellae living in it, so providing the colour. So what happens is when the coral gets stressed, the zooxanthellae gets expelled from the coral and it goes, no, I'm out of here. And that can happen from a change in water quality, like I said before, the change in water temperature either going up or down. Uh, So when you get floods, and fresh water that can change the water quality but can also change the water temperature making it go down one of the issues is that people say well what about in the red sea where the temperatures are naturally so much higher already and the coral's surviving and that's because it's acclimatized as such to those temperatures so what happens then is when the zooxanthellae is expelled the coral turns white so it can also be a fluorescent pink which can look beautiful but in fact it's it's not healthy at that point if the water temperature or whatever the cause of stress disappears within a matter of uh, weeks we don't have much time basically and I've experienced this myself when I lived up north on um, low isles and we saw during at the end of summer a couple of years ago just this massive coral bleaching throughout our whole reef there There was 55 acres of reef and we saw a lot of bleaching there and the water temperature mind you was at about 31 degrees which was pretty warm and you you kind of associate that with being far north Queensland, but it was um, very warm. And then within about six weeks, the water temperature had decreased enough and we could see from the point of bleaching to six weeks later, most of that coral had returned to its original colour. So the zooxanthellae had returned. So then it can survive. If those conditions, the adverse conditions, don't return to normal, that's when disease can start to access the coral. And another kind of algae, commonly called turf algae, starts to take over and create this cover. And that's when you get like a furry, sometimes you see on the pictures of dead coral, is like this furry um, sort of carpet of algae on the coral. Yep. And then if, and that once that's settled, then that starts to eat away the coral and kill it. So okay. when it's bleached, when it's white, it's not dead. Yep. So to answer your question. Okay. Um, but the conditions need to return to normal for it to be or reversed. Or it will die. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that explanation. Now got a much better understanding of what's actually happening there. So that that's yeah, good. no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that happens when the media reports how much bleaching there is on the coral reef is they'll often say that ninety percent of coral reefs are bleached, and it's not entirely correct. The Great Barrier Reef is made up of 
thousands of smaller reefs. Yeah. So it's might there might be a little bit of bleaching on ninety percent of the reefs, but it doesn't mean that all of those reefs are bleached. Yeah, like because that's yeah. like panicking, but it can. You know, and, and like that's obviously it's good to get people to, you know, want to save it, but not if you're sort of presenting them with information that they later go, oh, that's not actually accurate because then they just don't believe anything and go, well, then it's exactly. fine. Yeah. When that's it, right. It, it's not yep. fine. So what kind of consequences can we expect to see if the Great Barrier Reef is destroyed? We'll lose a lot of species of marine life. Reef fish is the main source of protein for many coastal communities, especially in developing countries. Also, there'll be a massive breakdown in the ecosystem. As I said, 25% of marine life relies on the reef to survive, to breed and to feed. So they will then potentially lose that. Also, the reef is basically working within the ocean. So if the ocean is damaged, we will have a reduction in the quality of oxygen that we breathe. Yeah, I have seen that like algae is like 50% of our oxygen supply. It's also drawing carbon. Yeah, That's the other thing that carbon algae sink. Does. What's interesting too is that that algae is eaten by certain marine life. For example, krill, they eat that algae and they eat the plankton. So they all, they sort of work together. And then when they poop, it actually creates this natural carbon sink as well so it all goes down to the bottom of the ocean and then when the whales eat the clankton when they um, excrete as well then it also dropped down to the bottom of the ocean and then when they die their whole carcass of course sinks as well and then that contributes to that carbon sink so it's, it's such a fragile ecosystem that's reliant on every single part to operate effectively yeah it's all very like interwoven and interconnected yeah now, going back to, to tourists, are we seeing any kind of like the masses of people going to see it? Is that causing any additional damage at all? Well, before COVID, around 2 million people per year visited the Great Barrier Reef, whether recreational or, or with a tour operator. The damage that they do, as I said before, is on the bottom of the list of negative impacts. But the damage that they do is things like if they're snorkeling or diving and they're inexperienced and they hit their flippers or their fins that will break the coral. Um, They could disrupt particular areas by touching things, by moving. You know, sometimes people want to um, pick up a starfish and, and on the surface it doesn't seem so bad, but then you are actually removing it out of part of its actual position that it, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yes, some of those um, critters do naturally move around, but on the whole, they are in a particular place because that is their habitat. And often they're sitting there hiding, waiting for unsuspecting food to come along. Again, it's minor. We have some areas where there's a large group of tourists that go there. So they're commonly known as sort of sacrificial zones. So there'll okay. be particular reefs where they'll allow the tourists to go in high numbers and they go, yep, okay, this area, we're going to contain it just to this area. So it may get damaged, but at least the rest of the areas aren't going to be damaged. They still remain pristine. So there are a certain amount of reefs open for commercial use and some of the tour operators have other ones up their sleeves. But some of the bigger operators that have pontoons, they can't go and move that pontoon with any kind of ease. They have yeah. to stay on that reef. So it's in their best interest to protect that reef and make sure that the tourists look after it as well. That's true. But yeah. also, as I said before, it's a really good opportunity to educate people when they're out on the reef and seeing it firsthand. So in general, you'd, you'd say, yes, go go be a tourist, encourage it. Maybe don't yes. try and pick up things, but do go and see it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, That's absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I, I've never yeah. seen it. It's like on my to-do list. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, yeah right. definitely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> That's good. You know, you, you've mentioned earlier that you only have a short amount of time to save things if a, a bleaching event occurs. Or can we actually save the reef? Aha. Another one of those holy grail questions. <laughs> Look, I'm an eternal optimist and I think that there will be some areas that will be sacrificed. Climate change is natural. Bleaching is also a natural event, but it's the frequency with which it's happening. So when a coral reef doesn't have time to recover 
and the next coral bleaching event's already happening, then it just can't recover. And that's when it just gets pounded and pounded and then dies. So I think if we can do whatever we can to try and reduce our impact on the environment, and that doesn't have to be when you're on the reef, that's from home, that's from wherever you are right now and doing whatever you can to try and reduce and try and keep that temperature increase down, then that's when you can then make a difference. And I think we have hope. I think that, yes, naturally parts of the reef will die, but they're discovering other parts. You know, researchers go out on boats and they find these other pristine reefs that have never been discovered before. So there are particular areas that are still well protected and unknown. And I suppose we do see that nature adapts, Tim. does. So I suppose what I had heard was that even if we limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, that that will still kill off most coral. So you don't think that that's correct. You think that we will, if if we can limit it, it'll be. Exactly. I I really don't know the exact answer, Rebecca, to that. I think, you know, one side says, oh, 2050, there's not going to be any more Great Barrier Reef. Whereas other people will say, well, if we do this, this and this, then perhaps we can save parts. And I think I have no doubt that large parts will die because David Attenborough said something like animals need to adapt sort of 10,000 times faster than they normally have had to because of climate change, basically. So Because we've accelerated uh, that process so much, yeah. Exactly. But if we can hang on, you know, if there are parts, for example, the um, Great Barrier Reef Legacy, which is a not-for-profit organisation in Queensland, they have what's called the Coral Biobank. So they're actually taking, with permission, they're collecting a piece of every type of coral that's out there. And they're putting it in an artificial growing environment. So, well, when I say artificial, it's still salt water, but it's it's keeping it alive. So we still have an example of it. It's yeah. not complete extinct because yeah. we still have it's like having we're an still keeping zoo, yes yeah it's just like keeping coral in a zoo just a that's right different kind of zoo <laughs> yeah that's I, right. I mean that that does make sense and I do hope that we are able to at the very least preserve a lot of the species that you know they may die out in the wild it gives, yeah. it gives us some hope and I suppose at the end of the day all we can do is our best and and try and save as much as we possibly can when we're talking about an individual's impact on climate change, um, what kind of behaviours have the most impact and, and how, how much of an in- impact can an individual even have? It's a tricky one because our behaviours over decades, centuries, have brought us to this point. Mm-hmm. So somebody, you know, not switching off their lights 25 years ago may only be seeing the actual impact of that now. So what's difficult is because we we want impact right now, if we're, you know, to use the example of turning off your lights and minimising your energy use, when you don't see an immediate impact, you think, well, what impact am I having? What's the use? It's not making any difference, but it is over the long term. So this is actually where things like, again, virtual reality and artificial intelligence and augmented reality can show people what their impact is having. So it can actually show you a a sped up version of the the change in water quality. So water acidification and how it can break down coral. So you can actually see it and go, oh, okay, so that's what my actions are doing over time. So it'd be good also to show people that in the other way. It's like, well, if you keep doing this, this is what's going to happen over time. So I I think on an individual level, there are many things that we can do. And if everybody's doing something, then that is going to make a difference. Really, though, we have to have governments, politicians who see that there is an issue and that can do something, will want to do something about it, not just about their four-year position or three years or however long their term is for. It's beyond that. Do you think that, like, political cycle, like the the length of it, it has caused a significant issue in political will in in having that kind of long-term sustainability plans? Look, I think it has. I I think to an extent it has, especially when the type of campaigning that goes on, especially in Australia, that it's slandering. It's it's not about what you're going to do. It's about what they're going to do that's going to make your life bad, you know, and that you should focus on 
taxes and the economy and that kind of things. But, you know, all those things are irrelevant if we don't have a healthy environment. It's a tricky one because when these policies are put in place, they should be long-term policies that are then continued by the next party, whoever it is. However, then where do you draw the line of policies that are perhaps detrimental and you go, yay, that party's out, let's now change it, you know, so it's a a bit of a tricky one. It's an issue because you've got like this ideological divide. If you have two groups of people who have very, very, very different ideas of the best way forward, then you are going to just have like this back and forth of we'll put in a carbon tax, nope, we're going to remand it. Do do you think that like there's also the the commercial impact of like, for example, things like the Adani mines and, and stuff where because that's such a big part of our economy um, that there's like a, a fear of, you know, losing that short term benefit to to our incomes. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's fear based. But when you look then at the amount of coal mining and agriculture in mm-hmm. Western Queensland, that's where you look at that population and they're fearful of losing their their livelihood and it, it might be better the devil you know that they just want to stay with what they've got they're not sure well what am I going to do and really you know fear is the opposite to understanding so if there was retraining um, also funding providing grants for some of these big farms and saying look we want to use your land we're going to lease your land for a solar farm or we're going to put wind turbines up here so yeah. you're going to get a percentage of it and in fact, you don't even have to do anything. You're just going to, we're just going to give you the royalties or, you know, they, they could be, or we'll give you jobs. Your job is going to be to maintain those solar panels and to maintain those wind turbines. So retraining, but it's not just retraining your skills, it's retraining your mind and your understanding, your headspace of what can work basically. So And also what's I needed think, um, because that yeah. is something that's changing. And I think that there's a very tradition focused attitude in, in people like, in agriculture, uh, this is the way that we've done things for so long and it's worked and we don't want to change yeah. that. I, yeah. yeah. I, I have um, family in Biloela, which is primarily yeah. coal mining, and I have an auntie who said, no, we won't allow people to put solar panels on the roof because yeah. husband works in for the coal mine and we don't want to, like, yeah. fund renewables because that's, you know, like they're seeing it as competition rather yeah. than an opportunity to go, let's transition where we're, you know, getting our power from or anything like that. So it's such a completely different mindset, especially when you have communities that are so entirely dependent on one specific thing. Like in that yeah. town, I think yeah. everybody works for or has family or who works for the mine like that's it that's the source yeah. of jobs in the town yeah. I spoke to a um a farmer recently that I met from Emerald and he said we spoke, we spoke a little bit about regenerative farming and he said there's been a shift he said um it's an interesting shift so people are starting to practice more regenerative farming practices in order to um, try something new because they see that what they're currently doing with the weather conditions that they have it, it can't is work. not necessarily <laughs> work. It can't. It's not sustainable. They're looking over the fence. What this guy this is exactly what he said. He said people are starting to look over the fence at the next door neighbor's farm, and, and we're, you know we're talking probably you know hundreds of hectares over the fence, but metaphorically speaking, they're starting to look and see what other people are doing. There's a shift. We just need to get to that tipping point. So what's happening now? is that there are some of these farmers who are practising certain techniques, but they're not willing to share it because they still see themselves as in competition with the next door neighbour farm. So they're like, well, no, we're selling right now. What we're doing is working for us. So we're just going to keep doing it and we're going to earn the money but not share it. So we need to get that mentality of, um, you know, the tribe basically to say that. Think of them as a a community and instead of just like that, individual greed level which I do understand especially if you've been maybe struggling with droughts yeah I can see why you'd be like yeah I'm just going to keep on doing this and you know that is very hopeful though I think that they are looking at those regenerative farming techniques and and actually following the science not sort of yeah sticking your head in the sand and going that's you know not going to affect me or 
I mean, I, I yeah. suppose we've gotten to a point maybe where you can't anymore. Like the last couple of years, especially, it, it's just been one thing after another. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't ignore it. No, yeah. no, it's just it's there. It's plain to see this is happening, and we have to deal with the situation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. exactly. And other farmers that I've also spoken to, they who are actually doing really well with the practices that they're currently um, applying, this one particular family want to change to more regenerative farming and they're actually willing to take a cut in profits to do wow. so and to drop their main supply chain basically that they supply, be this is a potato farmer, in order to be able to go to a 100% regenerative model of farming and they'd like to be completely organic, but then you've got all sorts of other levels that you have to then, uh, other boxes you have to tick in order to become organic. But it's not just about being organic because, well, personally, I just think that any farm, that any land that's been farmed, you can no longer say that it's purely organic because the soil has been ploughed up so much and so many, you know, various. But in saying that, I think that there are people who are willing to, you know, farmers who are earning with this family uh, they have a 1.5 million dollar industry in potatoes for you know that sort of season every year which is pretty decent for a for a family business that's just that part they also have cattle and they're willing as I said to take a cut in that in order to uh, practice more environmentally friendly. Do you think we'll um, ever see a shift away from cattle farming in general because I do know that it's a fairly unsustainable practice in terms of like land and water use? Look, it is, but again, if you do it regeneratively, so there's a, a concept called cover cropping where they, they grow a cover crop um, on the land and then um, they let that grow for a season and then they move the cattle around the paddocks in order to just eat the, the weeds and what happens is actually yeah. they are the weeds and then they're also becoming a carbon sink as well because it's allowing different species to grow together because having a single crop is not good for the environment. So I think that it could, definitely, um, if we get away from um, feeding them soy because I think that that's certainly one of the big issues that a lot of land clearing in the world is to house the cattle. It's actually to grow the soy for agricultural consumption. For for their feed, yeah. Yeah, that's like, you know, it's just so wasteful, I suppose. You're like, instead of growing food that we can eat, we grow food for our food to eat. It's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And even if you eat like tofu and soy replacements and that kind of thing as a human, I think from memory, it's only about 5% of soy farms that's actually used for human consumption. So wow. um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't feel guilty for having soy products when it's contributing to land clearing because it really isn't. So, you know, if they stopped using it for cattle products and just used it for humans, you'd we have more than enough and we wouldn't need to That's right. clear any. Exactly. <laughs> so then we'd get a twofold thing happening as well because some of that um, existing land or existing, you know, soy crop can be used for more human consumption and then reduce the need for cattle for, yeah. for meat. So, yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah. it all works really well together if we can. I suppose that, that that's what it comes down to, isn't it, having that like cultural shift in, in behaviour in people to yes. go, okay, th- these are – yeah, being aware of the impact of all of the different things that they're interacting with and consuming and, and going, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll change my behaviour to not be as wasteful and, you know, yeah. consumptive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think that's time for us. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. No worries at all. My pleasure. <laughs>